This is San Diego Earthquake Hazards and Preparedness Resources and Activities. It's a special webinar of Earthquake Country Alliance SoCal. And uh, we're very pleased to have you all here, the collection uh, and, and the presenters who have come together to uh, share information with you, as well as all of you, whether you're in San Diego County, probably I would assume most of you, uh, but some of you may be from elsewhere. So thank you very much for joining us today. As a reminder, if you've just joined, please put your questions into the chat as your presenters are speaking. We can then ask those questions uh, at, after each presentation. And right now I'm going to just kind of show you the agenda. It's the same you may have seen on the webpage when you registered. So we have just to show you that we have uh, presenters from many different organizations throughout uh, San Diego County as well as our other statewide partners uh, who will be kind of doing an overview of earthquake hazards, uh, a especially scenario for an earthquake on the Rose Canyon Fault. And then we're going to hear from the county and other county or level organizations, including the Red Cross and the, the voluntary organizations, active and disaster group of, of nonprofit organizations. Then we're going to share with you uh, Earthquake Country Alliance resources and activities and talk about ShakeOut coming up, learn more about Earthquake Country Alliance SoCal, and also our mini award program that you want to be on the lookout for applying for this fall. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Ray, who is the Assistant Director for the Office of Emergency Services at the County of San Diego. Stephen. You are muted. You're on mute, Stephen. Is that better? Yes, Sorry. it is. That is something that I shouldn't be doing anymore after all the Zoom meetings I've been in. Uh, but I wanted to welcome everybody to the Earthquake Country Alliance webinar. Uh, and I'm with the Office of Emergency Services. And a lot of people don't know what the Office of Emergency Services does, but we coordinate the overall county response to disasters. Uh, we're responsible for alerting and notifying agencies when the disaster strikes, coordinating all the agencies that respond, uh, ensure the resources are available and move to the right places at the right time, and then we develop plans and procedures for response and recovery from disasters. And of course, one of the biggest disasters we face and prepare for are earthquakes. I wanted to go to the next slide and tell everybody a little bit about San Diego County. Uh, a lot of stats here, but uh, very interesting things that you may not have known about San Diego County, that we have about 3.3 million residents, the fifth most populous county in the United States. Uh, we have 4,526 square miles from coast to inland valleys, mountains, and deserts. So you can go to the beach, go inland, uh, to a winery, go up into the mountains and play in the snow and then go to the desert. Uh, 70 miles of coastland, the biggest land border crossing in the United States. You can see over 19 million vehicles and pedestrians last year, a big tourist destination. Did you know that we have over 5,000 small farms in San Diego, more than any other county? Uh, we are ranked number 16 as uh, the most, uh, the county with the most risk we're, we're in that very high risk category with 18 incorporated cities, 18 tribal reservations, 16 military institutions, and of course, three fault zones. Uh, I'm seeing the chat that people are having trouble hearing me. Is, is uh, anybody want to comment on that? We are okay. You did just get louder a little uh, okay. moment before, so you're good okay. now. Okay. Well, let's go on to the next slide, if you could. And uh, this is a, a slide that really uh, talks about what San Diego kind of looks like from an earthquake point of view. We, of course, uh, when people come to town, they always ask me, do we have to worry about earthquakes? And it all kind of depends on where you're coming from. If you're from the East Coast, I'd say, yeah, San Diego does uh, have the capability of having some pretty large earthquakes. 
But if you're uh, maybe a community along the San Andreas Fault or San Francisco, definitely not the same level. But we do have our very own faults. We have, of course, the San Jacinto Fault Zone out there in the northeast part of the county, the Elsinore Fault that kind of goes right up the middle of the county, and then the Rose Canyon Fault that goes through the urban area of San Diego. Uh, and I always like to take a little, I, I call it my little walking tour of the fault, and it comes in off of Coronado Island through a lot of military bases. It goes right under the Coronado Bridge into the urban area of downtown. Uh, of course, it goes underneath the airport, which is all on, on uh, uh, fill dirt from the bay. Uh, it crosses over the railroad tracks. It crosses in underneath Interstate 5 with, of course, uh, we have pipelines and internet cables through there. And then it heads up through some of the most expensive properties in San Diego and finally goes off back into the ocean uh, around Mount Soledad in La Jolla. So there is a lot to think about when we're preparing for earthquakes in San Diego. Uh, so today, I would just want to thank everybody for being here and helping us understand the fault system here in San Diego. Really, we want to provide the next level of preparedness for our residents and also our neighbors in Mexico. I hope you enjoy the webinar and take advantage of these learning opportunities. And I too look forward to the presentations. Mark, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. We'll move right along and uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jillian Maloney, who is a assistant professor at the Department of Geological Sciences at San Diego State University and who's going to share with us San Diego County Earthquake Hazards Overview. And Jillian, you are now up. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm happy to be here to provide this brief overview. Um, I'm going to look at uh, the faulting and earthquake hazard in San Diego pretty broadly, um, with specific focus on the Rose Canyon Fault Zone, um, which Stephen just spoke about. Uh, so on the next slide, we're going to start really zoomed out. Um, so here, a picture of the whole world. We know that the outer crust of the Earth is rigid, um, and it's made up of these different plates that kind of float around on this gooey layer below. Um, and where those plates meet, they are those are called plate boundaries. So this one here is a divergent plate boundary where the plates are moving apart from each other. Um, and th those are in, yes, the, the center of the ocean basins. Um, most commonly. Um, and then uh, another one is the is where plates are colliding. Um, so this is a convergent margin. And we see those along the coast of South America, um, along the sort of think about the ring of fire um, around Alaska and Cascadia and Japan. Um, and then the third type is where the plates are actually moving alongside each other. Um, and this is called a transform boundary. This is actually what we have uh, here on on the west coast of North America between the Pacific and the North American plate. I think if you hit the next, it'll show the, the labels for the for those plates. So there's a, the big Pacific plate, um, which is under the Pacific Ocean, and then the North American plate, um, which is in the continent. So if we zoom into California and the West Coast of the United States, um, we can see San Diego down in the southernmost part of the state. Um, and next, will bring in those plate motions. So we can see that the Pacific plate is moving to the Northwest relative to the North American plate. Um, and this is a right lateral sense of motion, meaning if I'm standing on the North American plate, the Pacific plate, I'm looking at the Pacific plate, it's moving to the right relative to where I'm standing. Um, and this red line through California is the San Andreas Fault. Um, this is the big fault system that we all hear about in California. Um, that takes up a lot of the slip um, between these two plates, which is a total of 50 millimeters per year of movement between the plates. Um, but in the southern parts of our state, where we are in San Diego, this plate boundary is actually pretty wide. So it's going from the San Andreas Fault there out by the Salton Sea, all the way out into the offshore. You can kind of see where it says California borderland. There's a little change from light blue to kind of dark blue. This is all part of the plate boundary, and we're kind of smack dab in the middle of this here. Um, so I think the next slide uh, zooms in, zooms us in even further. So this will show the, the faults that make up that plate boundary. So we said we've got 50 millimeters per year between North America 
and uh, the Pacific plate. And here where we are, that's divided up onto a bunch of these different faults, which the major systems are shown um, on, this, uh, on this image. So all the way to the east, the San Andreas Fault, um, you can see out by the Salton Sea. And then moving west, you have the San Jacinto Fault, the Elsinore Fault, and then along the coast, the Rose Canyon Fault, which is the, a little bit uh, bolder pink line, as well as faults offshore. Um, You'll notice that there's these numbers on the faults. Um, so those are slip rates. This shows the San Andreas Fault has 22 millimeters per year of slip at this location. Um, and those slip rates are sort of time averaged, how much uh, displacement is happening from one side of the fault to the other over a long period of time. Um, and so uh, you know that's gonna be the biggest slip rate that we have here on the San Andreas. Uh, the Rose Canyon Fault is two millimeters per year. And if you combine that with all the offshore faults, uh, it's about 10 to 15% of the total motion um, between the North American and Pacific plate. Um, so that's sort of to say that, you know, although those faults to the east um, have higher slip rates, which means they either have to have bigger displacements during an earthquake uh, or bigger earthquakes or, uh, or and or more frequent earthquakes, um, they are they are far away. We would still feel the shaking from big earthquake earthquakes on those faults. But zooming into San Diego, um, which is where a, a lot of the people live, you can see this is a population density map. So really high population density in San Diego County along the coast. Um, and this is where we have the Rose Canyon Fault Zone, um, which Stephen mentioned is our uh, main seismic hazard in um, in San Diego. Um, and so this fault uh, is. Offshore, it's out in the ocean off of La Jolla. It comes on shore at Mount Soledad and goes along the I-5 uh, and then steps back offshore in San Diego Bay. Um, and so we're gonna look a little bit more closely at that fault, uh, but first just to sort of uh, think about other potential hazards and maybe additionally why the Rose Canyon is considered the biggest um, hazard here. There, there certainly are other faults and I mentioned, you know, those big faults to the east can cause uh, shaking that we would feel if you, we're here uh, in the uh, on Easter of 2010. You maybe felt the effects of the El Mayor Cucapa earthquake, which happened on a fault um, in Mexico, just south of the border, south of the Salton Sea. Um, and on this picture on the right, you can see in, in the colors represent the amount of shaking, with the red being more shaking and blue uh, being less shaking. Uh, and so, although we didn't feel the the biggest intensity of shaking because we weren't right near that fault. We did feel um, sort of was considered weak to light um, uh, shaking. I was actually out of town for this, so I um, I can't tell you what it felt like. But my roommate said that our staircase outside was kind of moving back and forth a little bit. Um, so faults to the east certainly we can feel those. That was a, a moment magnitude seven point two and an intensity of seven. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a second. Um, another one that comes up it. Um, a little bit more locally, but uh, important to San Diego is we do have faults offshore. And there was a felt earthquake in 1862 that uh, a lot of different people recorded uh, effects of that. So the, these blue stars on the left side are showing where people were feeling um, an earthquake or noticing effects of an earthquake, including things like liquefaction um, or uh, cliff failure, things like that. Um, and that one was based on available data, magnitude six, intensity six to seven. Um, on the next slide, it's just a quick, hopefully quick explanation of what those magnitude versus intensity scales mean, because um, you hear this a lot when we talk about hazards. Magnitude is the size of the earthquake, um, and a way to think about it is that it, for every number, so we know that's sort of, you know, magnitudes six, seven, eight, those are getting to be really big earthquakes, nine, um, some of the biggest ones we've ever uh, experienced on Earth. Um, every time you go up by one number, that's an increase of 32 times um, in, in terms of the energy that's released. Um, and the size of the earthquake is a function of the length of how much of the fault ruptures, um, how deep that rupture is, and how much it moves. And then the intensity scale is on the right side, and this just shows uh, a, a numeric scale to describe how much shaking is felt, how much damage is actually caused. Um, so that's more of a function of the distance from the epicenter. Um, what the geology is and how that rupture is propagating. Um, so those are kind of important terms to remember uh, when we talk about earthquake hazard and the differences between uh, what, what those scales mean. 
Um, on the next slide, we're zooming into a uh, sort of statistics here on the Rose Canyon Fault, obviously located in San Diego. Um, some of these important facts um, are things we we really consider quite a bit with seismic hazard. We want to know how long is it, what when was the most recent event, how often um, does it rupture? That's the recurrence interval. Um, what's the slip rate, and can we project project what size of an earthquake, what magnitude uh, we would expect? On the left, the map shows um, three different sites where we have estimated the most recent earthquake on the fault. Um, and sort of these are these are pretty consistent with one another. And we think, you know, the most recent event occurred with, within uncertainty sometime between AD 1650 and 1750. Um, on the bottom, on the right here, this is data um, from two different sites. So the way that we we get these data, are it's geologic data. We uh, observe the fault and get radiocarbon dates to see uh, when earthquakes have occurred in the past. On the left, this is a site at Rose Creek, which is sort of up towards uh, La Jolla along the I-5. And then on the right, that's earthquake data from old a site near Old Town. And those dates show, or those data show multiple earthquakes with a recurrence interval, recurrence interval, recurrence interval of uh, seven to 800 years. Um, and we have, based on all the data available on the fault, a slip rate of uh, probably closer to two millimeters per year um, and uh, potentially generating a magnitude 6.9 earthquake. Um, and then on this next slide, and I, I realize I'm probably out of time already, but just kind of something that's interesting about, uh, if you go to the next one here, the these strike slip faults, when they bend and step, um, they can create little zones of uh, uh, compression and transtension where there's either uplift or sinking. So uh, if you hit next, the uh, the bend of the of the Rose Canyon fault around Mount Soledad actually creates compression and uplift, and that's why Mount Soledad is there. And then the fault also steps offshore across San Diego Bay, where that creates transtension and subsidence, and that's why we have San Diego Bay there. These steps are important because with a with a small uh, gap between the faults, an earthquake can propagate across the gap. Uh, and with a larger gap, it probably won't, um, or it's less likely to happen. Um, so on the next slide, this just shows some of the some of the geography that's caused by the, uh, the Rose Canyon Fault, including beautiful Mount Soledad, and of course, San Diego Bay, which is really important for uh, Navy and commercial um, shipping. Um, and then just in terms of thinking about how that relate, how those steps relate to hazard. Um, the next slide just shows that uh, some recent work offshore, there's a bunch of different fault segments. And if they all ruptured together, which seems to be possible, that would create a larger earthquake. Um, on the left, we think this entire fault zone probably doesn't rupture together, but rather as a cascading series of earthquakes moving from south to north. Um, on the right, this offshore section may uh, rupture together. And I'm just going to go ahead and skip because I know I'm running over uh, to slide 13. I just want to give a quick plug and I'll put something in the um, in the slides here. We compiled this huge uh, geo database of 268 geotechnical investigations um, from 1978 to 2016. Um, this is all publicly available. It has, um, it has hundreds of borings, uh, seismic sections, cross sections, uh, trenches. And so I'll put that link in the chat um, for anybody that is interested in looking at that, um, downloading that database, and please feel free to contact me if you have any other questions about that. Uh, and I'll stop there. Sorry, I know that was too long. Thank you very much, though. It was very uh, informative, and we did get some questions coming in. Um, Gabby, are you on for asking the questions? Are you charting them, or uh, shall I? I haven't been. I I will. I, I can. Yeah, I can see them here. I think there were a couple. Uh, oh, there's one. Um. So the 1862 event. Yeah, it's not included in that. The 700 year recurrence interval is based on um, evidence from a, a trench across the fault at Old Town. So that's um. I think it was six earthquakes. Um. That you know if you how the earliest one to the latest one if you kind of take the average time in between them. Um, that's where the 700 year comes from. The 1862 is not considered a bigger event on this sort of like through going Rose Canyon fault zone. It, it may be from one of the smaller faults offshore. In this slide, you can see the Spanish Bight fault. 
that's one likely contender for the source of the 1862 event, but not going all the way through up to La Jolla. There was a question further back for Stephen Ray. Yes, it was, um, where does uh, San Diego OES rank the earthquake threat versus other hazards in San Diego? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I'll stick to, to uh, natural disasters. We just did a poll of this and uh, our number one uh, disaster from the, from the residents of San Diego is wildfire. Number two, strangely and surprisingly to us was climate change as the number one concern, which is drought and, and uh, inclement weather. And then earthquake rate ranked number three. All right, well, we will continue on and uh, just some information on this slide. The recording of today's webinar, the presentations and some additional resources will be on the same page where you web page where you registered uh, at earthquakecountry.org. Oops. And I, I actually realized there's a, a word missing here. Earthquakecountry.org slash event slash SD AUG 2022. We'll correct that. We'll put that in the uh, the right link in the in the chat. Also note that there's a survey we're doing. So later on, it before you leave, please uh, uh, look for that link in the chat, and you can click on that too when it when it comes on. For right now, we're going to move to our next presenter, uh, who is Jorge Meneses, who is the president of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute San Diego chapter, uh, was also a California Seismic Safety Commissioner, and on the overall EERI Board of Directors, and many. Uh, uh, letters after his name uh, for different engineering uh, degrees and 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 such. So, see, uh, so Jorge, if you could go ahead and uh, begin, I'm going to find you and make sure that we can see you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation and for the introduction. Uh, what I'm going to present is really a really 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 overview because I have material for not 10 minutes, but for 10 hours. So I will try to make it very short, okay? So if we move to the next slide, we are going to see what is a scenario. A scenario is something like, a, what if? Uh, what if there is an earthquake in San Diego County? And what are going to be the effects of that earthquake in our buildings, infrastructures, economy, and people? Okay, this is what we did. This is nothing new, this has been done before uh, and actually was originated back, you know, during the uh, World War II, uh, the Manhattan Project, military exercises, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this stuff we are being applied now to earthquakes and also other disasters. So in the next one, we are going to see specifically what were the points or the issues, the items that we were addressed when we were developing this scenario for uh, San Diego, uh, identify the geologic hazards, estimate the building and infrastructural damages, the social disruptions and economic losses, assess the level of seismic vulnerability of the San Diego community, inform long-term earthquake and resistant planning and preparation. So in the next slide, you are going to see a photo uh, that for me and for us, you know, that participated in this project, is a historic project. This photo was taken like seven years ago now. It was the first meeting that we were that we did just to start coordinating and see what will be the next steps, you know, to do the, the scenario. Some people believe that we are going to make it this in, in one year. I, I told them, no, 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 this would take much more. And actually it took like about five years to complete partially what we have already published and released uh, back in 2020. So why we are doing now, or why we uh, try to do this uh, scenario now? In the next one, you are going to see that initially, a uh, planning scenario was developed back in the 1990. So we took a look at this scenario and we obviously realized that it was completely outdated. Uh, however, there were some essential characteristics that we believe should remain the same. So number one, 
is that the importance, the significance of the Ross Canyon Fault. And number two, that is, if we want to address the hazard to San Diego County, we cannot do it just only addressing San Diego County. We have to do it along with Tijuana. So we realized, and on those years already, they realized that San Diego and Tijuana is somehow an integrated region that working together. It's even the pandemic has illustrated that kind of um, connection between the two regions. So that's why is that we try to address, and we are trying still to address in not this only, not only to San Diego, but also San Diego Tijuana. The report that you see there in 2020 and is published in, uh, is posted in our website. You just can Google E E R I uh, San Diego, and you find our website, and you will find this uh, report. Uh, is addressing just basically San Diego. Our counterparts in Tijuana are still working. They have much, uh, much progress done so far, but there will be a point in which we are going to merge both, uh, both reports. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, Rose Canyon is very, very important for us because I think that this is unique characteristic, unique setting that um, fault of these characteristics is running through downtown. Is uh, we ran the scenario for a magnitude 6.9, and then we evaluated. I mean, there was a special team doing the evaluation. You know what could be the characteristics of this scenario earthquake, the characteristics of the rupture, etc. Um, based on those uh, decisions that they made, is that we could uh, have an estimate of what could be the distribution. I mean, how the seismic waves will be activated. In the next slide we are going to see an animation of, of this. So you see the star, the star indicates the epicenter, the origin of the, of the earthquake, and then the uh, seismic waves start propagating, and you will see that more or less in about 12 seconds is hitting already Tijuana, crossing the border and hitting Tijuana. The way that we developed the scenario was also in such a way that we could develop uh, somehow a greater hazard if the rupture uh, pointed to toward the south, okay? And this is the, what we did uh, here. So in the next slide, we are going to see the distribution of the earthquake intensities uh, in the region, in the, in the county. We are going to see the characteristics of the, you just click and you, you skip, yeah. Uh, you can see the basic characteristics, you know, magnitude 6.9. This is a strike slip uh, fault. Uh, surface fault rupture of about two meters. Surface fault rupture of two meters, the uh, maximum. Uh, we evaluated the distribution of this uh, surface uh, fault uh, displacement or rupture at several locations, but what are the maximum that we could uh, uh, identify? So it will be a very, uh, I mean, big uh, disruption. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Here, we are going to see some examples of what we call surface fault rupture. And something like this may happen if the Ross Canyon is activated. The difference with these photos is that what we are seeing here in this photo as examples, past case histories, we are going to see through downtown and through urbanized area uh, in San Diego. Next, please. <clears throat> Something that we realized when we developed this scenario was that we are going to have not only the problem of surface fault rupture, but also important occurrence of liquefaction. As you may know, the San Diego Bay was basically shaped with artificial field. When they did this, they didn't have any idea at all about what we call now liquefaction. And we know that many areas, including the entire uh, international airport of San Diego is sitting on liquefiable soil. So this is something that we have uh, realized that is one of the uh, most important effects. Uh, um, a surface fault rupture, number one. Number two, liquefaction. And number three, very intense ground motion shaking because of the proximity to the Ross Canyon Fault. Uh, next, please. And liquefaction is, of course, when the soil becomes like a liquid. 
And because the salt becomes like a liquid, the buildings, bridges, airports, etc., just sink into the into the into the soil. That is now like a like a liquid. What were our findings? So in the next one, we are going to see a, a, a summary of the findings, basically in terms of uh, buildings um, um, infrastructure. Infrastructure. Uh, $38 billion uh, because of damage to buildings and infrastructure, about 8,000 buildings damaged beyond repair, about 120,000 buildings suffering moderate, moderate to complete damage, and about 36,000 households displaced by the event. These uh, estimates were not done just only, you know, because we are, have a crystal ball or something like that. We use a computer program, Haslus, developed by USGS, and with all the information that we had about the infrastructure, building, et cetera, in the region, with the information about the fault, is that we run the program and we had uh, we made these estimates. In the next one is that there is a summary of the key findings, uh, basically about uh, buildings. And we know that uh, many older, more seismically vulnerable buildings constructed before modern seismic design provision were in place, including several key city of San Diego facilities, may be severely damaged with multiple older buildings potentially suffering partial to total collapse. In the next one, we are going to see these uh, diag bar diagrams showing you know, the extent of damage uh, by the type of the structure, steel, and reinforcement or rebuilding, precast, manufactured, housing, reinforced concrete, especially the non-ductile uh, reinforced concrete buildings uh, and wood. In the next one, we are going to see <clears throat> that some special studies found that there are about between 3,000 and 8,000 seismically vulnerable buildings in the city of San Diego alone. These structures have generally been not been inventoried or addressed other than a modest URM program that was some years ago. This is something that we are trying to push to do this inventory and to know exactly what are those buildings. Of course, typically the un unreinforced uh, masonry buildings. So in the next one, we are going to see also key finding in other uh, aspects, like for example, coastal communities may be cut off from nearly all lifeline utility and infrastructure services, water, Waste water and gas line services west of the fall rupture zone are estimated to be out for months. This is very well, very well mapped in, in our report. In the next few slides, we are going to see distribution of the damage, for example, to the water system uh, in San Diego. In the next one, the distribution of the damage to the wastewater system impacts. Imagine that we don't have water and we don't have the way wastewater system working in certain areas. That would be terrible. The next one, we are going to have the transportation impacts, uh, especially because of liquefaction occurrence, uh, surface ground uh, fault rupture, and also, of course, the intents of the, the, the big intensity of the ground washers. In the next one, we are going to see some key findings we are uh, identifying some potential locations where we are going to have the combination of the three acting uh, and affecting a transportation system. And you know, if transportation systems are affected, of course, that will pose a, a big challenge to emergency response, right? So in the next slide, we are going to see some examples of past earthquakes of transportation uh, disruptions. In the next slide, we are going to see just one example on one of the most crucial intersections, the uh, I-8 and I-5, in which we are going to have the three, right? Liquefaction, uh, surface uh, fall rupture manifestation, and intent ground motion because of the very close proximity to the fort. So you cannot ask for something worse here. <clears throat> 
In the next slide, we are going to see, you know, well, the consequences, right? Uh, when the transportation system is affected, complicates uh, emergency response, compli complicate travel to emergency uh, shelter, cause business disruptions. And of course, because we are a border city, the trade, the trade between uh, San Diego and Tijuana will be seriously affected, impacting the economy. In the next one, we are going to see some uh, aspect also of the damage to <clears throat> lifeline disruptions. Here you are going to see, you see some past example, you know that uh, breakage of a water system, gas utilities, uh, this uh, 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 uplift of manholes, et cetera, et cetera. In the next one, we are going to have a, a summary of the key findings on this regard, response to fires caused by gas line breaks and electrical failure or malfunction would be challenging with a loss of water pressure from damaged water systems, especially in coastal uh, communities. In the next one, we are going to see a distribution uh, of the damage to fuel transmission system impacts. There is a lot of military information here that we didn't, we didn't have access, but the one that we had access, we could identify the locations that, where this could happen. In the next one, we have just a brief summary of this impact, right? Um, especially, you know, the San Diego International Airport, the Port of San Diego, that by the way, both of them are using our scenario for the San Diego International Airport is using our scenario for uh, improvements and also for the, their annual preparedness. We are always getting invited to those meetings and also the Port of San Diego is using this scenario for improvements. So this is something that uh, we feel that uh, our scenario is being, in be, is being used. In the next one, <clears throat> we are going to see the damages to critical infrastructure, right? Military, manufacturing, uh, by direction trade, you know, with Tijuana, uh, tourism, of, of course, and complicate receiving emergency supply uh, shipments. Next one, please. Uh, we already mentioned about the, what, I mean, the international airport is in a very, very critical place. They are aware of this. They are doing a, a plan of renovation, retrofitting programs, et cetera, et cetera. So moving in the direction of trying to mitigate as much as possible the possible effects of an earthquake like the one that was developed in this scenario. The next one, please, this is a, a key dam a damages to over 100,000 residential structures coupled with high current high housing costs and low vacancy rates may exacerbate existing housing affordability issues in coastal communities and potentially cause residents to leave the region. This is something that was evaluated by the social group that was involved in our, in our study. The next one, please, we are going to see here the importance of uh, the housing stock in the vertical axis. You see the number of structures and on the horizontal axis, the year. And you see this year, the very important uh, 1994, before and after. The, the houses built before 1994 are more vulnerable than those houses built after this year, okay? I don't have the time now to develop this, but uh, it, it, this, is, this is documented in our, in our report. The next one, the city of San Diego is ranked as one of the least affordable cities in the US. Vacancy rates are currently very low. Most of the damaged housing is multi-family a housing. Okay, so based on these findings means that we are trying to do, well, what to do with this? I mean, we just don't want to report uh, and do nothing. We are trying, we are suggesting some step for the path forward, and we developed a kind of vision 2050, a seismically resilient uh, San Diego, and we propose 11 steps that are listed in the next uh, slides here. Step number one, develop, continue developing the countywide resilience review. Uh, number two, develop a regional seismic mitigation strategy. Number uh, three, uh, compile inventories of this vulnerable uh, structure. 
Number four, number four, assess local land use and zoning practices and recommend actions, of course. Number five, utility stakeholders coordinate resilience planning, emergency response, and mitigation of line line networks. Uh, attention to wastewater facilities. Next one, please. Water utilities prioritize investments to prevent prolonged disruption in coastal areas. Number eight, the port addresses seismic hazards in upcoming revitalization plans. They are doing this now, as I already said. Uh, emergency response plans addressing this particular hazard. Conduct, of course, public preparedness campaign that we are doing on a regular basis here in, in San Diego. And finally, the San Diego Antiguana Integrate uh, Agency counterparts in emergency planning and response exercises to build cap capacity in cross-border coordination. As you can see here, we didn't address anything about climate change issues. We didn't address anything yet about uh, uh, social vulnerability issues that, I mean, with the pandemic, this was very evident. We have to remember that the current pandemic is a natural hazard also, the same as a natural hazard of earthquakes. So we are trying to incorporate and see how the uh, climate change is, is affecting uh, seismic resilience. And this is something that for, for this, we are, or we are organizing an event on September the 2nd, the 2nd of September, in which we are going to address these issues uh, about the relation between climate change and community earthquake uh, resilience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just obviously everyone, we got a very high level overview there's a lot of detail in the report and uh, we put the link to the report so you can read the complete uh, study and and really review all the details just provided. We do have a few questions and it time for 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 a couple. Uh, Gabby, do you want to read the questions, please? And then we'll take the, uh, sure. Um, the first one was, when was the land for the airport dredged? Uh, when the airport was built, uh, and when the airport was built, did they perform any ground improvement? When the airport was built, they didn't have any idea about liquefaction and about the soil conditions that uh, will affect the proper foundation design for the airport. So that's why is that, for example, they didn't, the, the original building was not uh, built on five foundations. This is something that they did afterwards for Terminal 2, and I think now they are in the process of doing the same for Terminal 1. So, but the, uh, we have to remember also something very important, okay? When most of the current infrastructure and buildings uh, were built and designed in San Diego, we, did, we were not aware of liquefaction. We didn't know about this, okay? We didn't have the knowledge that we have about this now. Number two, in those years, the Rose Canyon Fault was considered inactive, okay? So these two things are very important to understand why we have this high vulnerability in our buildings and infrastructure. Okay, next question. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the next question is, um, an earthquake called the Rose Canyon Fault could cause or create a tsunami in the local area. Has the tsunami impact been included in this study? The Rose Canyon Fault, yeah. to the best of my knowledge, of our knowledge, I don't think that has the capability of induce a tsunami. However, uh, there was a long debate, and I, I, I think the debate is still going on, is that if, this earthquake, for example, may cause a submarine landslide in front of the San Diego Bay. Because if you see a cross section of the coast, there will be a very, very uh, steep slope, submarine uh, slope. Okay, that if this slope fails because of this earthquake, they will have the potential to create a tsunami that will be devastating to San Diego. There was a long discussion about this. I personally believe, my opinion is believe that we need more information for this. There are studies showing the failure of the landslide. I reviewed those studies. 
But I think that we need still to do more studies, uh, especially take sample from the from the place, etc., uh, and rerun and reevaluate that, that, that analysis. All right, we are behind, so we do need to move on. Uh, Jorge, if you're able to look at the questions and respond in the chat, if yeah, that's sure. possible, just make sure to reference the question uh, so the, the answer uh, when you type it makes sense. You can, if you move to the right of each question, there's three dots, you can copy the question and paste it and then your response. So thank you very much. So we will move on and with all the information we've heard about what might happen uh, when this uh, when an earthquake on the Rose Canyon or even other faults uh, occurs, we're now going to hear um, what organizations are doing to help people be prepared to survive and recover. So we're bringing back Stephen Ray uh, from the County of San Diego with a presentation on the, uh, the San Diego County plans. Hi, everybody. Back to me. What I wanted to do for this presentation is talk a little bit about the resources for emergency management, uh, you know, the, the public sector, and also uh, resources for, uh, for the residents of San Diego. And I wanted to be able to show you kind of both sides of what we are doing here at OES. And I'm going to start by uh, some of the planning that we've done. Uh, we we look at, we take an all hazards approach, of course, and we look at all the different types of disasters that could affect San Diego. And we put our responses in a plan called the Emergency Operational Plan. This is updated every four years. In fact, uh, it's going up for approval just at the end of the month from the board, a brand new updated operational plan. And this plan actually uh, is a big plan, over 500 pages. Uh, it has 16 annexes in it, uh, things like what fire and rescue will do, what law enforcement will do, public health, multi-casualty, medical examiner operations. We call that a functional plan. So we look at the different functions of the, of the agencies and departments and how they can operate. But we do, uh, we took a, uh, we took a uh, special approach to creating a hazard specific plan for earthquakes in San Diego. We wanted to take everybody's actions and narrow it down to what they would do in an earthquake. And uh, we use that, of course, to help our large scale planning, which I'll discuss in our recovery, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Uh, the California, uh, also, I should say on the next bullet point here, the state has a plan it's called the California Catastrophic Earthquake Plan. It really is focused on San Andreas, on the San Andreas Fault. But a lot of what the state's response will be is covered in this plan. One of the best benefits that we get from the state is this idea called mission requests. Mission requests, uh, we can request things from the state. And if the state uh, doesn't have the resources, it can come from the country, from federal resources to ensure that we have, uh, can recover our supply lines as quickly as possible uh, during an earthquake or following an earthquake, security is going to be of a large concern. We do have the California National Guard as one of our resources. And our focus of uh, the injured as well as sick following an earthquake, one of the most difficult uh, um, Lifelines to restore will be transportation, uh, really transportation of the sick and injured, because there, of course, is a, a time period where uh, you need to treat injured people. And with the failed infrastructure and, uh, and roads being impassable, transportation is going to be a, a, a focus area of ours. I would like to point out one thing that we're doing in San Diego. It's called the Re Advanced Recovery Initiative. Every government employee in the state of California, not only does their government job, but during a disaster is a disaster service worker. Uh, so we have uh, at our fingertips really about 20,000 disaster service workers who work for the county. But what we are doing is taking that effort, extra effort to train them. So uh, it's always better to train folks before a disaster than to try to do it as part of the you know, quick training as a response. 
So over the years, we've trained over 2,500 county workers in areas like how to run a shelter, how to run a local assistance center. If uh, you're trying to call uh, the San Diego County info line 211, of course, after a disaster, they tend to get overwhelmed. So we've trained quite a large number of workers to help answer the phones. So we've, we've really spent our time looking at uh, our response to uh, an earthquake like this. There is another plan that I'd like to mention that actually uses the scenario that just was discussed by Jorge, and it's called the Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. This plan uses the same uh, type of data that Jorge used. It's, uh, it's a computer program, GIS program called Hazus, and we look at the impacts. It runs, a scenario, it runs the scenario and looks at the impacts of infrastructure and lifeline damage. But what we are able to do with that plan is uh, use it to apply for grants to help mitigate some of the damage that could be caused by an earthquake. So uh, we rely on some of our other departments in the county and our cities in San Diego to contribute to the plan. And then once that happens, there are grants we can apply for to help improve things like bridges and roads. Uh, and so we are really focused on doing that. Uh, and that plan is also coming out, a brand new version of the plan is coming out early next year. Uh, of course, earthquakes are no notice earthquakes, uh, or no, no, no notice disasters. With wildfires, we usually can see them coming with, with uh, Santa Ana winds, with uh, large atmospheric rivers, we can usually have those forecasted days in advance. But an earthquake is not one of those. So the, the uh, response to an earthquake really uh, aligns with the recovery piece of an earthquake. It happens almost at the same time. I wanted to point out some of what we will focus on in the short, intermediate, and long term. First of all, uh, the highest priorities in the short term will be transportation routes, restoring uh, access into the affected areas, uh, reestablishing cash flow, uh, trying to get the economy back running again. A lot of people will say uh, want to donate uh, material things. And we, of course, don't recommend that. Uh, if you can bring cash into the county, that's the biggest help. So if you're donating, please consider donating uh, money when there is a disaster. We wanna focus quite a bit on medical and mental health services. There's gonna be a lot of injuries, both physical and mental after following an earthquake. Um, temporary housing, of course, that's, that's gonna be one of our main focus areas, uh, making sure that folks will have a safe place to stay uh, while they are assessing the damage and rebuilding. And then I mentioned hazard mitigation. We want to be able to focus when, when uh, locally, if there are these are the local hazards. These might be gas main leaks. This might be, as Jorge mentioned, water or wastewater lines, and repair those as fast as possible in the short term. In the e intermediate term, of course, we're looking at a, a more solid housing footing, being able to bring in temporary housing from FEMA. We're looking at chronic health issues and public health things that uh, are not the immediate things like uh, injuries, but longer term health problems, maybe from uh, lack of resources or uh, effects from, from uh, debris. And then also to restart the economic engine to get our stores and our services back up and running. And then looking at the long term, we wanna take that housing solution to the next level uh, we are looking for lots of state and federal funding assistance and also beginning our mitigation strategy for the next disaster. We want to make sure next time that happens that we'll be prepared. For public resources, I wanted to point out a few things that we have that we're proud of. One is readysandiego.org. This is a website that we use during a disaster. It has incident information as well as mapping of the disaster. Uh, it includes preparedness and recovery tools, as well as official social media sources. In that website, there's a Know Your Hazards map tool. If you type in your address, 
uh, you can find out what your particular address is, uh, is uh, what the hazards in your local area are, not just earthquakes, but fire and tsunami and flooding. Uh, we also have Alert San Diego, our region's mass notification system. Along with that, somewhat newer of a technology is wireless emergency alert, so we can contact you via a push notification to your cell phone. We also have the SD County mobile application. This is something you can download to your iPhone or Android. And uh, one of the newest abilities of the mobile app, something that was released last year, and then I'll talk more about is uh, Shake Ready San Diego. This is the earthquake early warning system, but uh, it is focused on San Diego. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so the Shake Ready SD was added to the mobile app last year, and it uses the USGS Shake Alert network. The sensor is already in place. We're actually we're the, the third application to provide earthquake early warning. In San Diego, in California now, there's only two. There's the MyShake and there's ours, which is uh, Shake Ready SD. We use a statewide grid system. Again, this is actually not just for San Diego, but we decided to make it uh, statewide and we'll alert users closest to the epicenter and then of course move out in widening circles. Uh, and uh, we do have that little wizard to help you set it up that actually turned out to be the hardest part is getting the iPhones and Androids uh, willing to accept push notifications, things like that. We will alert uh, residents for an earthquake of a 4.5 magnitude with anything above a three on the intensity scale. Uh, Shake Ready SD will activate. It will send uh, the users a push notification with an alert tone and also an English and Spanish language warning telling them to duck cover and hold on until the earthquake is over. We've been able to test this and on average that alert will get out finally to the holder of the phone under five seconds uh, as average. So let's go on to the next slide. If we could. Uh, so some capabilities of Shake Ready SD. Of course, we talked about the automatic alerts. Uh, we have linked to USGS through our app. They have some great resources, including recent earthquakes and shake maps. Uh, USGS also sends up follow-up information about the alert that we've added into our application. We have uh, maybe something a little more than uh, the other application in the state. Uh, not only do we have earthquake preparedness materials, but our app is an all hazards app. So not only will they stick around for earthquake, they can find out about wildfires, they can look at maps of current disasters and get updated information. Next slide, please. I uh, uh, mentioned earthquake preparedness. Thanks to the Earthquake Country Alliance, we've used a lot of their graphics in our materials. Uh, we wanted to make it as easy as we could for everybody to navigate. Uh, we also have the Shake Ready option to opt in right from the, the uh, preparedness screen right when they download it. And we have these things that nag you to make sure you sign up for Shake Ready. And everything that we've done, not only the educational material, but the app itself has been viewed and reviewed by the USGS and approved. Next slide. So just some next steps. We are modifying our app a little bit to do some public testing. We want to be able to try the system out and, and get the public to understand what the warning is going to sound like and what it's going to look like. We also wanted to do some silent testing to be able to ping our systems to make sure it's still operating. And our really our main goal is to move from this pilot phase to get a license to operate. Uh, there's two ways to do that. One is to get the silent testing up and running and working right. And the other way to move to license to operate is to have a real earthquake. And we, we uh, want to avoid that one if possible. That's why we're bringing on silent testing. I think that is my last slide. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, it's always an ongoing effort to prepare for disasters in San Diego, and we continue to take these steps. And uh, we feel that we're a leader not only in California, 
but also in the nation on our preparedness, especially earthquake preparedness. So thank you again, everybody. And Mark, back to you. Mark, you're muted. Thank you again, uh, Stephen. And if you wouldn't mind likewise responding to some of the questions posed to you in the chat. Uh, sure, we're a couple about your presentation as we are pretty far behind and need to move on. Uh, just it looks like only since about 359 uh, or so. So uh, again, thank you. And we will now proceed to our next presenter, who is Melissa Altman uh, with the American Red Cross. Uh, brief presentation on their earthquake preparedness uh, role after an earthquake and resources. Melissa? Thank you, Mark. I will be quick, I promise. We'll try to get caught up a little bit. Uh, uh, so in case, I hope all of you are aware of the American Red Cross, but in case you're not, um, I first want to point out, I think our presenters painted the picture of the likelihood of disasters is high, especially earthquakes, um, a big earthquake be catastrophic. So just to give you that picture already, let's talk about what that means for us. So a little history about Red Cross. So you might know, maybe not, but we actually have a congressional relationship with our federal government. We have a charter that actually sets out responsibilities of the Red American Red Cross as an independent nonprofit. And it's a very unique relationship. No other um, nonprofits have that. But part of our responsibility is to actually fulfill the provisions of the Gen Geneva Conventions, which includes protect protection of victims in conflict, to provide family communication and other forms of support to the US military, but finally, to maintain the system of domestic and international dis uh, disaster relief. So that includes all the mandatory responsibilities under the National Response Framework, uh, coordinated by FEMA. So we actually have a responsibility to um, and a commitment to our partners and the federal government. And what does that look like for us? So what we like to say uh, is our mission statement. And this should really clearly say what, we, what we're doing out there. The American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. You should know that we have a lot of work that gets done in a lot of different ways. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of it on the next slide. So the main thing we focus on is in a big disaster or even a small disaster, it's maintaining, um, just making sure to meet all people's urgent needs. So this includes shelter, food, health and mental health, and then distribution of emergency supplies to meet basic human needs. So as they painted already, that could look really different since um, infrastructure shuts down, uh, they, the ports might shut down, we can't get any more supplies, the roads are shut down, so we ourselves will be affected. Uh, not, not only that, about supplies, we also have volunteers uh, and staff members that do the work for us, they are also going to be affected. So this will disrupt all lines of service, disaster responders um, across the, uh, of the board. So. Given that, this is why we talk about preparedness. So uh, more things that Red Cross does, again, our focus is adapting and adjusting. We are constantly changing and making sure to fit the needs of our of, um, the population, as well as we have to think on the fly. We don't know what's gonna be happening or going on, so we constantly have to change and adapt. Um, but during these large scale disasters, we open up care and reception uh, centers that have um, uh, different resources available and our shelters that are going to be overnight uh, facilities and it's a safe place to stay. It has access to food, to comfort items, to health and emotional uh, services and more. So we really want to make sure that the people that are displaced during these large scale disasters like an earthquake are going to have somewhere to go. That's what we're here for. Now uh, we always say everyone is welcome. There's no exception to this. Um, everyone, if you don't mind going back to slide. Uh, everyone is welcome. We want to make sure that no one feels restricted to coming. We don't do background checks. There's no uh, addresses checked. This is everyone is welcome, period. Uh, we also offer casework, which is at the um, going to be at the shelters as well as afterwards, where we follow up and connect different clients that have been displaced and affected by disaster with different resources, not only through the Red Cross, but also connect them to different um, community partners. And finally, we're gonna remain open until no one needs us anymore. So we will be there no matter what, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and again, we're there trying to make sure everyone has their basic needs met. So on this slide, we're talking about 
then no one else does this. There is no other entity, um, government or charity that has this these capabilities or that uh, is required to do these types of things. So we do the small home fires and the multi-state natural disasters, uh, which we have some going on right now, as you can imagine. Uh, so the American Red Cross goes where we're needed so people can have clean water, safe shelters, and again, hot meals where they need them. Uh, we respond on average to about 60,000 disasters every single year. It's quite a bit. And again, 95% of our disasters um, are actually um, carried out by our volunteers. So that's, um, you can just say that we have amazing people that do the work just out of the kindness of their hearts. So it's pretty amazing that we're able to do the things we're able to do. Okay, so how do we prepare our region? So in the, uh, the downtime where we're not responding to a disaster, we are preparing for the large one. We have hundreds of shelter agreements where we um, survey them and, and make sure they have the certain facilities that we need, but we're going into them and making sure they're um, gonna be able to, in a moment's notice, turn on and let us respond and open up a shelter for um, the clients that are if needed. So we have these agreements already um, out in those communities and thankfully a lot of the uh, you know, schools or other casinos, they've um, had those agreements with us and know that it could be a request that comes their way. We also have pre-staged vehicles, trailers, containers all across the county, making sure that emergency supplies, if one of them gets uh, shut off due to transportation breakdowns, we have other facilities as other vehicles that are able to respond. So we don't put all our eggs in one basket, as they say, we spread out so that we're able to quickly uh, adapt and get there in a timely manner. And we always are required by our national office to have a certain level of emergency supplies. So we actually have several warehouses, including here in San Diego, that have these supplies. And again, we have a large transportation and logistics teams that can switch in very quick uh, timing to making sure those uh, that equipment gets to where it's needed. We train, I got brought up uh, a little earlier, we train and we practice. We don't just send people out blind. We want to make sure people know what they're doing, know what to expect. And so we do it a certain way so it's safest for the community. And finally, we have a uh, year round testing of our people, our infrastructure, our programs and emergency systems, making sure we're um, up to par and ready for any kind of thing that might come our way. Cause again, you never know when disasters are gonna, get, are gonna come. All right, and then uh, we are creating partnerships. We're always making sure that different partners are gonna hear from BOED a little bit. They're one of our wonderful partners. Uh, we always are reaching out to our community to make sure that the partners know our uh, capabilities and that we know theirs. And so we can really work together to make sure we um, meet every unmet uh, need at the time. All right, resources though. This is community preparedness. I wanna let all of you know that we have tons of stuff available, including free disaster preparedness presentations for both businesses and community. So businesses, about 40% of them don't survive um, disasters because they're not ready. So businesses also have to get ready. If you could go back one slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we wanna make sure that people know how to get by. It has a very devastating effect on the community because um, it has a domino effect. If the business doesn't stay open, people don't have jobs, then they leave that community. We also offer free youth preparedness presentations for kindergarten through fifth grades. We have an emergency um, app that gives emergency alerts and you can monitor other locations. We have free preparedness books and I can uh, share one, uh, the copy with you, but they're great to use as an active workbook for you and your household so you're more prepared. Uh, we also do um, uh, books for older adults, um, both in English and Spanish. So those are gonna be um, uh, wider things and a little bit more condensed, but we want everyone to be aware of what they need to do to get prepared. Um, and we offer free hands-on CPR training. Um, like was said earlier, emergency response um, teams are gonna be restricted on coming to help you. You need to be able to help yourself. So be uh, CPR trained. We have classes available for pay, um, but those are great certification classes so you know how to save your loved ones. Uh, we offer free smoke alarm installations and also free shelter training for our partner organizations. We want to make sure everyone knows what we do and where, um, what to help with when that time comes. Uh, so a couple other things that we offer, and this is a lot of it on the website. You can also email me on the next screen. I'll have my information. But we have a great website, Prepare San Diego or Prepare SoCal. Those websites have a lot of information. There are tons of information, books and handouts. Uh, feel free to look through it. 
We also do um, free emergency checklists, and we can include one in the free resources a little bit later um, on earthquakes. We teach, like I said, those uh, prepare Pedro is our uh, kindergarten through second, and then the uh, pillowcase projects is third through fifth. These are offered both in um, English and Spanish. And the idea is that we want to create a culture of preparedness, start children at a young age to make sure that they get prepared. Uh, finally, please follow us because we send out preparedness and information, emergency alerts, as well as updates on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So those are our handles there. And if you're still uh, up for it, because it is an amazing experience, I myself started as a volunteer. I would greatly love to see you out there helping your community by becoming a volunteer. The website's there. If you've had any questions, contact me. My name is Melissa Altman. I can connect you to different people within our organization. And again, we want to make sure everyone gets prepared because it's just a matter of time. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'll take them. Thanks, away. Melissa. If you yes. can put any links you liked to uh, in, this, in the slide we're now Absolutely. A half hour behind, so we need to move <laughs> on, and uh, yeah. and uh, we didn't get caught up. The uh, we're uh, we're going to move very quickly to comments from Valerie Brown uh, with the voluntary actor organizations active in disaster, and we still have a couple presentations to go. So, Valerie, you're up. Right. Really, I will get you a little time back um, for this. So. San Diego VOAD is Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. We're a county chapter of a national uh, effort uh, to help communities and the local nonprofits and those larger nonprofits such as Red Cross work together in the, we're, we're, we create a collaborative space for all of the work that's going on in the, in the larger community. We amplify that information, that education, the resources to better protect our community. Um, and so like for the great shakeout, we encourage stuff, uh, information on that, get that out to people to participate. Uh, we've been focusing very heavily the last year on access and functional needs, helping our nonprofit partners, which also include our faith-based partners um, and um, general traditional social service agencies, as well as those that focus strictly on disaster space uh, to, to help improve what we're doing there so that we're able, better able to protect our vulnerable populations. Some examples of that before the earthquake, uh, and, and I'm hoping the earthquake is well after my lifetime, um, educating people on earthquake insurance, how to navigate it, how to get it, how to take advantage of those bolt and strap programs, things like that, getting emergency kits, creating plans. Um, you know, we, we, because we are that collaboration space, we're often able to reach people where they are so that we're able to get them the information they might miss that's going out because we've got a lot of great resources, but we need to connect them to that. Post-disaster, we, we're the convener. So, uh, you know, we're looking at in response, um, you know, supporting shelters, providing food. Um, we've got partners who provide those ham radios that'll go out to the hospitals and other places that need that for communication when uh, traditional means of communication are down. For recovery, we've got volunteers that typically partner with the county on debris removal. Uh, they, you know, these partners are providing financial assistance uh, through traditionally case management. And then if we get into long-term recovery, what that would look like is those case managers, the disaster case managers that are helping people develop what that recovery plan would look like. And what happened in, after the 03 and the 07 fires, where we actually had volunteers come in from across the country to rebuild homes for people. So a uh, large spectrum of uh, scope from really small groups to uh, national organizations and international organizations. We're all here focused on helping bridge the gap between what's available here and what we see that the needs are. So I will put in the chat our website and hopefully I've given you a little bit more time back. Thank you very much, Valerie. And I'm going to continue with a uh, very quick uh, overview of Earthquake Country Alliance and resources before introducing our SoCal chairs for ways that you can participate locally. So we do have four regions. Uh, San Diego County is included within the ECA SoCal region. We also have sector-based committees that work together, together on a statewide basis. And while I recognize many of you, many of you have come onto this webinar from emails from other uh, partners represented here. So if you're not a member of Earthquake Country Alliance, please join us, it's free. You'll be updated on our upcoming activities and new resources as they're developed. There's a link in the chat right there, earthquakecountry.org slash join. Our support does come from the California Office of Emergency Services, 
uh, uh, who gets funding from FEMA through a national program as shown on the screen here, uh, and also some of our other support for our home organization at the Southern California Earthquake Center through these organizations as well. And our statewide activities, of course, are our website. So please do know that earthquakecountry.org and terremotos.org in Spanish are uh, kind of one-stop shop for a lot of this information, uh, a lot of our activities and resources and, uh, and webinars. Uh, of course, we, we support uh, tsunami preparedness as well, tsunamizone.org uh, for Tsunami Preparedness Week, which is in March coming up. Shakeout we created back in 2008 and went statewide along with ECA uh, in 2009. Find all our activities um, coming up and in the past at earthquakecountry.org slash calendar. Uh, we encourage you to join one of our sector-based outreach committees. Uh, as you can see, the topics that are here that work together to create new resources for these sectors and help make things for you and your organization, as well as for others. You can learn more about these at Earthquake Country of the Work slash committees. And uh, we do have some outreach bureaus that do uh, kind of boots on the ground outreach activities and reaching out to people uh, to recruit their participation and work with the news media. And uh, Alan's gonna say a little bit more about the events bureau coming up. And really it's want to highlight, whoop, that a key aspect of our message that you'll find throughout our resources are the seven steps to earthquake safety. Really trying to have this be a, a common structure throughout the state for how we and beyond for how we talk about what to do before, during, and after. We uh, uh, put secure your space first as it really is this, what uh, can prevent things from falling and flying and causing injuries. The most source of injuries in earthquakes is are, are those items not the building falling down uh, just because uh, there's those things are falling and flying within all of the buildings, only certain buildings are having a, a risk of collapse. And so uh, that type of work kind of ends up looking like this. And so I just wanted to show some pictures of what really good uh, structural or rather non-structural mitigation looks like when you're securing objects so they won't fall uh, or fly cause injury or damage. So we're gonna look a little bit more of that coming up. We also are very proud that we've uh, we've created and, and updated 13 documents now available in 15 languages. And so if you do outreach to uh, multi-language groups or any, any particular group that you'll find there, we have uh, the documents all together and also have created now special web pages for each of those languages. So you can refer people to that. So you can find that again, earthquakecountry.org slash languages are a key message as part of step five, what to do during an earthquake versus drop cover, hold on. But it's not just that basic aspect of getting down so you're protecting from things that are falling or flying by getting under something. Uh, you're also not moving. You're, you're not being knocked off your feet. You're not walking through broken glass. It doesn't in, uh, increase the chance of surviving. You're dropping where you are, you're covering your head and neck with one arm and hand. And then if you're able to get crawl to get under something nearby, then do so. Otherwise stay where you are with both hands and arms over your head and neck. Just make yourself a smaller target. You can get next to an interior wall so that you have things only being able to come at you from one side. And the key thing is that you wanna adapt this messaging to your situation. So we do have guidance for what to do if you perhaps use a cane, keep that cane with you to help you get back up again. If you use this type of walker where you can sit down, you can do that, or you can get down even lower. Your uh, wheelchair and walkers, you wanna set the brake or lock, however it is, so you're not rolling around, bend over, cover your head. It's all about protecting your most vital uh, body parts and making sure that you're not, uh, what, if you do get hit by something that you're more likely to survive. You wanna do this, of course, when you feel earthquake shaking, uh, even better if you've been able to get an earthquake warning uh, right before the shaking arrives so that you're already in that position. And another time you should kind of practice this, of course, is during the shakeout coming up on October 20th, though you can do your earthquake drill any day of the year, of course, and any time on that day if you choose to join everybody, you know, the large number of people participating that day. And do go to shakeout.org slash California to register, to participate, tell everybody you know to do that. 
tell everybody in your organization, yes, we're really going to do this and really do it. It really does make a difference for when the earthquake does happen that people have practiced it in advance. And we do have options still for remote participation. If people aren't all back in the office, uh, you can still, as was done during the peak COVID, people were doing their drills over Zoom like this. It's really possible to do. And we do have presentations that you can use for either way, whether you're together in purpose, uh, in person rather, uh, or uh, connecting uh, in a hybrid mode or all on Zoom. These can be used to run your drill. Uh, lastly, I want to highlight that we do have a, a program that will be coming out in the fall with the application process. Make sure you're a member of ECA so you get the notification. We do provide packages worth up to $500 to $1,000 each focused on earthquake mitigation and education. The current web page that's put in the chat isn't updated for the 2023 program yet, but you can see kind of the basic details uh, for how, uh, what that's going to look like and the type of packages that you uh, can apply for. And uh, I'm going to skip through and uh, introduce our chairs of Earthquake Country Alliance, Southern California, Margaret Vinsky from Caltech, Alan Hansen from Simpson Strong Tie, and Heidi Rosofsky from Global Vision Consortium. In that order, as that's the order they're going to be presenting. So Margaret, you are up. Okay. So thank you, Mark. So as chairs of the ECA SoCal Coordinating Committee, Heidi, Allen, and myself are excited to be working with all of our San Diego partners and communities. And so the SoCal um, uh, is comprised, the coordinating committees are comprised, they meet about once, uh, once every other month. Uh, and then each committee itself will then hold their own meetings in between to execute their projects. So this is some of our, our committees that we have. We have our Meteor Bureau com uh, Committee, which is conducts and promotes ECA events, or they don't conduct the events, but they promote ECA events, outreach, resources through the media. We have our Participation Bureau, which are representatives from various organizations that work to encourage, monitor, and track shakeout participation throughout Southern California during shakeout. Uh, we now have a new committee called Shakeout Testonomy that actually coordinates specific shakeout events and works on our main media event every year. This year up in Southern California, um, up in our area, it is going to be at Huntington Library. This year we have a main media event and we want to encourage this type of event down in San Diego as well. So we want to work with you with, through our media bureau, through our shakeout coordinators uh, to be working with San Diego's to be able to serve on these committees as well. You will note that we have two openings uh, for coordinators with our regional workshops. Uh, that is a person that helps to coordinate with our chairs to coordinate our quarterly regional workshops. Our next one actually is next week on August the 24th, which will be a statewide meeting. Uh, so far, they've been online or virtual meetings for the last uh, two years, but we hope to move to face-to-face -to -face, uh, pretty soon. So we're looking for a coordinator to help us with that. Also looking for a coordinator that will help with our member membership. And it would be very nice to have somebody from San Diego area as well to be a co-chair on that committee uh, to be able serving the San Diego area. So um, with that, each committee offers leadership opportunities and there we have an open invitation to all of you to participate in these any of these committees that you would like to join. We would love to have you and we'd love to be working with San Diego uh, partnerships uh, um, more readily. So uh, also I want to introduce Gabrielle Noriega who is our ECA SCEC regional liaison and she keeps us organized as well as filling in all of the gaps uh, to keep us going. And one of our last um, uh, coordinated committees is our events committee. And I'm gonna turn that over to Alan Hansen, uh, one of my co-chairs that's gonna talk about our events committee and all of its resources. Thank you, Margaret. Um, really, um... Looking forward to uh, promoting the um, events. Um, was uh, very happy that we're doing a San Diego specific webinar. So Gabby and I did a CISA convention, California Emergency Services Association this past May in San Diego. So met a lot of you folks down there. Uh, we uh, had a uh, San Diego uh, gas and electric event this past weekend. So that was one that we um, exhibited at. Um, we, um, I think we have another slide coming up. Mark, can you 
go forward on this. Thank you. Yeah, and there's my wife and I at the uh, San Diego Gas and Electric event and the Red Cross tent as they were uh, getting ready to uh, to close out for the day. So there's the link to the various events and we'll um, be happy to help you out on your various events. Thank you. Let me just add, Alan, that what this is a link to is to actually complete a form to request a speaker for giving an online or in-person presentation as listed here, uh, or to request uh, ECA representation at your event with a booth or a table. Thank you, Alan. We'll now turn to Heidi to uh, talk about many award opportunities briefly for ECA SoCal. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, will you advance the slide for me, please? Whether, whether or not you're, you're going to be getting involved in activities or you're just interested in the mini, uh, mini grants, we would ask you to join ECA so we can keep you informed as well. The mini grants, as Mark showed, is really a way for organizations to be able to do a small project, particularly related to mitigation within their community um, using the $500 or $1,000 worth of supplies that uh, allow you to do it. The, uh, the mini grants, uh, um, the application process will be coming out in the fall, so you're going to want to um, to make sure that you have a notification on that, so you can get any uh, um, any requests for funding in. As you can see from the list here, we've got a lot of different organizations that have that in our 2022 did uh, receive ECA mini grants, and the ones that have asterisks are are here in the San Diego area. So we just want to make sure that you know about that resource and that um, you can apply for it to, uh, to make sure that you can continue to further prepare uh, your resilient community. And to give you an idea a little bit about what that's like, I'd like to introduce Candy Alvarez, who's the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator Health Center Partners of Southern California, who has actually done two mini grants very successfully. Candy, it's up to you. And let me just acknowledge that we are um... Kind of over time as we plan, but please do stay on. We only have a few more minutes to hear from Candy, and then we will kind of have open discussion as long as you'd like to stay on for maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. So, Candy, please go ahead. Is Candy still with us? There she is. You're on mute, Candy. You're, up, yeah, there you Sorry go. About that. Hello, everyone. So I am with Health Center Partners of Southern California, and we are a consortium of 17 primary care health organizations. And myself with my peer, we run the Emergency Preparedness and Response Program. And our main goal is to help our community health centers prepare for public health emergencies. And here you can see um, the logos of some of the members we serve in the community. You may be very familiar with these. And they're all from in San Diego County, ranging from Imperial Beach all the way up to North County, San Marcos, Fallbrook, and then it goes all the way out to Julian. So we have sites um, that we serve throughout the entire county. Next slide, please. Oh, it's going a little bit fast. <laughs> So the first me award that I won was um, regarding education, and we call this project Prepare with Rocket. We won 1,000 of the Rocket's Earthquake Safety Activity Books, and this was to improve uh, earthquake awareness and preparedness among children ages three to nine. And they were for our member health centers, for the children of the staff members, um, and children for the patients, and then we did it for, um, for health center partners as well. And these books uh, came from the Hero and You Foundation. And once we received them, we shipped them back out and they, they do come printed in English, but there is a huge array of uh, languages that you can also print. Uh, next slide, please. And so to make it uh, more engaging, we created an incentive um, to ha have a giveaway. So these children could read these books with their families. And then we asked for them to return a page uh, from the book and have them color it 
or they could have watched um, the Rockets Rules for Safety that is both in English and Spanish on YouTube. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a couple of pictures. Um, this is what the inside of the book looks like. The children loved it. They got really engaged and they really liked the fact, or the, I should say the parents, they love the fact that they could watch the videos uh, with the children. Next slide. And here's just an example of the giveaway. We made them um, an emergency go bag specifically for children. Um, and I actually included a small checklist for the parents. And the big takeaway from this one was parents really liked how um, they were able to go through everything with their kids and just think about how they needed to be more aware and be more prepared. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the second mini award that we received was regarding mitigation. So um, I created this project called When Health Center Shake. And we went through the facilities and assessed risk. And um, fortunately, I was able to work with two of our member organizations. And you may know them, uh, Father Joe's Villages. They have a four block campus in downtown San Diego and also Neighborhood Healthcare. They have 17 uh, locations, which is medical, dental, behavioral health facilities. Um, and with the package that I received, it was $500 from Ready America. They were all mitigation materials. You can see the examples of what we won. Um, the earthquake fasteners, the different kinds of straps, um, hooks, latches, the museum putty, um, and then a gas shut off wrench. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So here are some pictures um, that we took inside the facilities. Uh, on your left-hand side, you have Father Joe's Villages, and I worked with their site manager to go through um, the reception areas, the, the lobby, um, the housing facilities, uh, the medical uh, rooms, and you can see that we used um, the straps, museum wax, um, and then on the right-hand side, we focused more um, with the PPE warehouse in neighborhood healthcare. Um, as you can see, uh, they uh, really like the bookcase straps and also we will use the furniture safety straps and that was uh, greatly used mostly for refrigerated items such as um, vaccines and insulin and let's see and then in the end um, just to continue the education for our uh, program I created a booklet just to include ideas for all these mitigation efforts and um, just showed how they can purchase more items from Ready America. And then, and finally, this is our motto, prepare together. We try to get our health centers to prepare together, make sure we are resilient. And that is it. It was great. Thank you so much to ECA for the mini awards. Thank you, Candy. We really wanted to have one or have a someone who's received the mini awards uh, uh, share the, their experience and and fortunately, Candy's organization and Candy has have uh, had both types of awards that we provide. And again, there's links to uh, the mini award page where you can see the type of packages that are available. You can put your own package together worth five hundred to a thousand dollars. Uh, but there are rules on kind of what level of funding are available. And we really are looking for um, people who, who really need to be ECA members uh, before they apply. And also uh, the, the uh, you'll see the rules there anyway. So uh, thanks again, Candy. Thanks again to our chairs uh, for their overview of ECA SoCal. Uh, while we all are over, uh, we do have some questions in the, the chat. That, are, that have been asked. Is there anything unanswered yet? Um, Gabby, have you noticed? And it, if not. No, I didn't notice. Um, I think there were a couple and Alan answered, um, but if anybody wants to share other um, programs available for low income home owners in San Diego, I think that was the last one. Yeah, there's a mention of the Brace and Bolt program that does, um, uh, you can uh, look that up to get information about when the application for that will be available for certain zip codes. You may get up to $3,000 for retrofitting 
older homes uh, with uh, crawl spaces uh, generally, but they're expanding that program to other building types as well. Uh, I want to make sure everybody knows about uh, a statewide workshop next week that we'll be hearing more about those opportunities for funding. Uh, if you'd like to uh, hear what happens in the other regions, BCA, Bay Area, Central Coast, the North Coast, and all the committees, please join us then uh, on, on August 24th, uh, 10 to noon. And you can find out information about that, uh, the registration page and all at earthquakecountry.org slash calendar. Uh, thank you all for staying with us. Any final questions? Uh, you could even just ask your question versus taking the time to type. Anyone? Okay, any final comments from our ECA SoCal chairs, Margaret Allen or Heidi? I just want to say thank you all for being here, and we're looking forward to expanding our relationship and partners within the San Diego area, and uh, to see what uh, what you guys have, uh, you know, can come up with that can help us all as we are all on this mission to 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 make a more resilient Southern California. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you all for uh, joining us today. We had a great turnout. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. And again, this the recording will be available by early next week on the same page that we've put where you registered uh, here. And there will be an email that come out. If you do join ECA, you'll get those updates as well. Thank you. Have a good rest also, of the Also, if, if you want to save the chat, it will give you access to all of the links. So don't forget to save the chat. Yeah, at the bottom of your chat window, there should be a, three dots that has an option for saving the chat to your local computer. Hmm. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.